Choosing the right implant system for your office has never been an easy task. In today's webinar, we will get to know the key points that are involved in such choice with an experienced implantologist who switched to BMB Dental System. Dr. Andrew Hall has been a lecturer at the University of Bristol for several years. He has been dedicating all of his clinical time to implant dentistry in Oxfordshire. He has now 20 years of experience in implant dentistry and he is mentor for the Association of Dental Implantology, while constantly engaging in training and education. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Andy Hall. I'm an implant dentist based in Oxfordshire in the UK. And welcome to anybody that's out there um, to this next uh, instalment of the B&B Pills series of educational webinars. Uh, thanks very much to Ella at B&B for inviting me to, to give this presentation. Um, and basically, I've been asked to talk about my experience using the B&B system over the last one and a half years or so. There are really two things that I want to, to share with you in my presentation. Firstly, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and my journey in implant dentistry. And then I'm going to concentrate on my experiences using this system and really why I've chosen to switch to using B&B. &B. So first is a little bit about me. Uh, my name's Andy, as I said, uh, this is me in my clinic. Um, this is uh, one of the clinics I work in on the outside, just on the outskirts of Oxford. This is the beautiful city of Oxford. Um, it's also known as the City of Dreaming Spires, as you can see there, but it's probably a little bit better known for its little university that we've got here. So about me, I'm a, a proud Welshman. I was born and brought up in Wales and I went to Cardiff University. Um, I spent several years in various hospital positions doing uh, restorative dentistry and then oral and maxillofacial surgery. And then I spent the next 13 years teaching at the University of Bristol. First five of them was I was a full-time lecturer in restorative dentistry. And then for another eight years, I was a part-time teacher, again, in restorative. I placed my first implants back in 1992. So I've got almost 30 years of experience of, uh, of placing implants. I moved into private practice in Oxfordshire, firstly concentrating on implant dentistry. And then for the last 12 years, my, my practice has been solely limited to, uh, to implant-related work. On average, I place and restore between 250 and 300 implants every year. So it keeps me pretty busy. I'd like to say I was doing, um, doing full arch cases every day, but uh, still the bulk of my work is, uh, is single tooth cases like this, um, or uh, just uh, small, small implant cases of two or three implants. But I've got plenty of experience over the years of doing big cases such as this one, uh, which I did with, uh, with guided surgery over 15 years ago now, and I'm pleased to say that's, that's still going strong. Um, over the years, I've done a lot of bone grafting. I've spent a lot of time training and perfecting these techniques. Uh, I really enjoy doing it, but uh, strangely enough, my patients don't enjoy it that much. So uh, as the years have gone on, we've uh, been looking for other techniques that we can, where we can uh, do more minimally invasive augmentation uh, techniques or indeed try to avoid augmentation altogether, often using guided surgery to make the most of any available bone that we, that we do have. Uh, I've also been quite keen over the years on, uh, on using autologous growth factors and specifically the PRGF technique as shown here in order to enhance wound healing. Um, in cases such as this, I think it works fantastically. It's lovely to see the sort of results that we get uh, after a week's healing after some fairly heavy duty surgery, as you can see in this case. I've also been uh, a keen advocate of digital dentistry over the years. I think I'm probably what you call an early adopter. Um, it's getting over 20 years ago now that I first, in, uh, um, first bought a Serac machine when I was still involved with fixing teeth. Uh, but thankfully, I've given up fixing teeth now and just concentrate on replacing them. It's also uh, almost 20 years ago that I first uh, bought the, uh, the Simplant system as well um, for, for computer guided surgery when it was considered a bit of a novelty back then, whereas now, of course, it's, uh, it's fairly mainstream. And then I think it was six or seven years ago now that I bought the, uh, the, the three-shape Trios scanner, which was a complete revelation to my practice, and there's no going back from me now. So all of the cases that I do these days uh, are done digitally um, using, uh, using Trios scan, scan bodies, as you can see here, and a fully digital workflow. 
So over the years, I've used a number of systems, and then sort of out of the blue, I got a phone call from this uh, this this gentleman here, who's a friend of mine, uh, Dominico, who is the uh, the uh, the British supply, supplier for for B and B, and he he just said, he phoned me up and said, Andy, you've got to come to Bologna. I said, why? He says, you've got to come and meet these guys out in B and B B and B implants, and I said, B and B who? I've never heard of them. Anyway, first of all, I thought he was talking a lot of bull, really, you know, but um, I don't need another implant system. Why do I need to go out there? But anyway, on the promise of some, some good Italian hospitality, food and wine, off I went to Bologna in July of 2009 to the B&B factory for a, for a two-day course uh, where I met these three wonderful people. Um, I'm sure you know them. We've got Ella, Simone and Joanna, and we had... Uh, uh, a two-day course there, and I was just totally impressed with the whole setup. Not just with the, the technicalities of the offer that they had uh, had there, but I was also really impressed with the way that, uh, that uh, these guys operate. It's very obviously a family-run company, and uh, I couldn't speak highly enough about the way that we were welcomed into to being part of that family. So while I was there, um, I decided to, to take the leap and to, to, to give these implants a go. Um, and in fact, what, during one of the coffee breaks there, uh, I got my laptop out and uh, as I just received a CT scan and I had the STL files from my trio scan on the laptop and we actually sat down and during a coffee break and planned a case that I was doing a couple of weeks later. Um, and we set the wheels in motion and uh, then a couple of weeks later, I did my very first B&B implant case. Probably not the best case to start with in fact, but hey, in at the deep end, I probably should have started with doing a single tooth upper premolar or something, but we decided to, to have a go at this fairly challenging case of uh, uh, for a full upper immediate loading case on a patient that was dental phobic with a strong gag reflex, complex medical history. But anyway, this is what she wanted. She wanted to go from where she was today to a, to a full arch fixed restoration. So we went through the digital planning, um, incorporating the STLs into the into the plan here, and we planned the placement of six implants with uh, the removal of the remaining three maxillary teeth at the front there. So we went through the usual workflow. We prepared the, uh, the digital models with the analogs of the MUAs in place. We prepared a surgical guide. We also pr uh, produced a temporary, which was made from uh, milled PMMA, but was then reinforced with a laser sintered titanium bar. And this just illustrates how these two fit like a hand in a glove. So we then went to surgery. We placed all of the implants transmucosally. After we placed the implants, we did a little bit of grafting here. We fitted the MUAs and we fitted then the, uh, the, the, temporary, the, the temporary bridge cylinders. We tried in the temporary bridge and check the occlusion, which I was very pleased to see was absolutely perfect. So we picked up the cylinders with some resin, did our final trimming, uh, finishing, a little bit of staining and glazing there, and fitted the restoration. So I was quite happy with that as my, as my first case. So that was the end result after we'd swapped it out for a PFM restoration three months later. So what's been my experience with b, &B uh, since that first case? Well, I, as I said, I started placing the implants back in, uh, in August 2019. And to date, I've placed just over 400 b, &B implants. Obviously, it's been a little bit less because last year wasn't terribly productive due to viruses and little things like that. So we've also been using the B&B &B production lab for making models of buttons and frameworks. And I've recently started using the B&B &B planning software and also the surgical guides. So this is a big question, eh? Why did I switch to B&B? &B? Um, and this is what I'm hopefully going to spend the rest of this, this lecture talking about. So I, what I'd like to do is to look at the various features and benefits of the system. And hopefully you'll see why I decided to make the switch. So these are the features and benefits that I'd like to go through. Firstly, the two main implant designs. Uh, with B&B, &B, basically we have two implants in the same system uh, designed for different types of bone. And this, I think, was probably the main reason that attracted me to the system. I'd also like to look at the Connexa connection, which is just amazing. Uh, we'll look at the implant surface. We'll look at the use of the, com the compactors and expanders, which are great tools. 
We'll then spend a bit of time looking at guided surgery. Uh, a few words then about pterygoid implants, which is uh, obviously a newer offering from uh, from B&B. And then finally, just a few words at the end about the other offerings that we have from B&B, maybe the slim, the wide and yuxta grid implants. So let's go through each of these seven points. So firstly, two main implant designs. On the right hand side here, we have the 3P implant. And on the left hand side here, we have the EV implant. And let's look at each of those. So first of all, the standard 3P. This is what I. This is my standard workhorse. This is what I plan to use in the vast majority of cases. It's a fairly standard design with a progressive tapered implant. Uh, with oops, backwards. Sorry. There it is. Um, so so we have the 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 the, uh, the the fairly standard threads here, but we have micro threads up here to avoid cortical compression. Uh, and this is, this is the implant that I choose. Uh, which in most cases where we have uh, moderate to good bone density. It requires a fairly precise drilling preparation and we, it has, gives you great control during the preparation, during the insertion. By contrast now, we have this EV implant, which is a completely different beast, which has much more aggressive flutes. Um, and consequently, it will create more compression within the medullary bone and give us much better primary stability. So it's ideal in cases of D3 to D4 bone, where these threads will, will cut into the bone much better. So it's great for post-extraction conditions, great for immediate loading. It requires smaller diameter preparations, and it also permits us to change the direction of insertion during the course of insertion. So this is what I go to when I feel that the bone is not as, not as dense. So how do we choose 3P or EV? How do I choose? So let's think about that. In the vast majority of cases with moderate to hard bone, my preference is for the 3P implants. But when the bone isn't as good, I will reach for the EV. EV the uh, are excellent for use in immediate extraction cases where we're looking to fix the implant into a limited amount of bone, possibly in the apical part of the extraction socket. And really when we're making these decisions, a pre-op CT evaluation is completely inv invaluable. But for me, I always make the final decision about which implant I'm going to place after I've prepared the osteotomy at surgery. And in helping me to assess the, um, the, uh, the density of the bone, I find that the use of the bone compactors is, is the way to do it. It really gives you much better feedback on the, uh, on the density of the bone and consequently on what stability you're going to achieve than you will ever get using burrs, even at very low speed. So I always use bone compactors as the, uh, as the last step before I place the implants. When I'm preparing for surgery, I always like to have the equivalent EV fixture available, uh, ready to place if, if I choose. Um, and remember that's gonna be half a millimeter larger in diameter than the equivalent 3P. So for example, if I'm placing a, a 12 millimeter by 3.5 uh, 3P implant, I always have ready on the side a 12 millimeter by four millimeter EV implant. And as I said, I can reach for uh, the um, I can reach for whichever one I want to after I've assessed the bone density um, using the the compactor instruments. Just a couple of cautionary notes. Uh, I'm quite keen on doing ridge expansion uh, wherever necessary in order to avoid bone grafting if I can. And in these cases, I think you should seriously avoid the EV implants. Uh, in these cases, the bone on the, the labial aspect of the osteotomy is often very, very thin. And the, uh, the stresses that are placed on that thin bone by the aggressive threads on the EV implants really will very often cause, cause, cause fractures within that, uh, within that plate. So uh, if you are doing a, 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 a ridge expansion case, then my preference would be to, um, uh, to, to stick to 3P if you can. And uh, please try and respect the bone tissue and uh, always try and fixate the implants within the medullary bone, not the cortex. Please try to avoid uh, gaining stability by, by compressing that cortical bone, because if you do, you're going to kiss it goodbye and get sorcerization of the bone around the neck of the implants.
And finally, remember, we are placing these implants into a living human tissue. It's bone, it's not wood, and therefore we are surgeons, not carpenters. So, on to the next of our points there, the Connexa connection, which really I think is, is probably the, the best connection that I've seen on the implant market today. So when we look at the Connexa connection, the first thing that we notice is that we have a step at the top of the implant here uh, um, of uh, uh, before the uh, the implants uh, before the implant abutment emerges from the implants. This is termed as we know now platform switching, as opposed to uh, a standard regular type platform implant or a, or a flat to flat as I call it here. So this platform switching uh, is a great advantage in terms of maintenance of the tissues at the crest there. Uh, basically, it's shifting the biological width. Um, it's allowed putting a horizontal component as well in, into the biological width and allows for more tissue proliferation of, uh, of soft tissue and even bone tissues in some cases into this region at the neck here and will give you a better long-term tissue stability there and hence, we hope, long-term aesthetics. We also have this, uh, this five-degree taper uh, between the, uh, the, the implant abutment and the internal uh, cone within the implant here, which we call a Conomorse effect. This has the effect of eliminating micro movements between the implant and the abutment, and it takes all the stress off the screw that's going down through here, and it basically eliminates the possibility of, uh, of loosening of the, um, of the abutment screw. In all the cases I've done to date, I have not seen a screw loosen. Also at the base of the cone, we have an indexing hex, which is important uh, for the correct seating of uh, personalized, individualized uh, CAD CAM abutments and also for, for angulated abutments uh, in order to get the, the correct emergence there. And finally, as we seat this, uh, this implant and we compress the two components together by, by tightening the abutment screw here, effectively we are, we are driving a wedge into the socket here and it creates what we call a cold weld seal where the two in the two things can't be separated so it's creating an, an hermetic seal here which hinders bacterial proliferation and therefore that's going to have an effect on preventing bone loss which is uh, is fantastic in that it gives us an extremely stable connection between the implant and the abutments of course the flip side of that really is that uh, if we try to, if we need to remove the abutments, the crown for any reason, then it's pretty much impossible with our fingers, even after removing the abutment screw. And therefore, that's what, why we have B&B have developed this fantastic screw extraction system, as you can see here, where the, uh, the instrument engages that removal thread and just pops the thing out. So uh, uh, this is an, uh, an essential part of the kit if, you, if you're doing any prosthetic treatment with this system. But overall, the uh, the Connexa connection is is just uh, fantastic. I think in terms of uh, giving you a, a very very stable interface. And the other big advantage, of course, across the, uh, the 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 lines of EV implants is that we have a single prosthetic connection. So for all of our prosthetic components, for our, our abutments, our healing abutments, our impression copings. Um, etc. Uh, we don't have to worry about carrying a huge stock of the things because uh, they fit into all of these different implants, which is fantastic in terms of uh, of uh, of, the, of uh, the amount of stock that you have to carry. If you compare this to other systems, notably sort of Strauman, you you have a ridiculous number of different types of connections there. And consequently, you're probably having to order components specific to every single case that you're doing. Whereas with BB, I'm, I'm confident that uh, I can go along to clinic with my little bag of components and I will have the right things ready for each case. So the next thing we're going to talk about is the surface of the implant. And as with most modern surfaces, we have this micro textured surface. And in the case of B&B, it is created using a double acid etching process. And etching gives us these, these two real benefits of the surface being absolutely clean of contaminants. And uh, it gives us a very uniform surface too. 
So the etching produces these little pits on the surface. We have this surface porosity of between two and 10 microns, which gives us a very biologically active surface. But over and above that, the surfaces of the, of the um, BB implants are treated by argon bombing, which cleans any possible contaminants and it activates the metal atom, atoms, um, which makes them more receptive to reaction. And so this gives us in total a, a surface that's really very hydroph hydrophilic. And uh, at, during the, the healing process, after they're placed into the, uh, into the osteotomy, the, this surface readily holds the fibrin threads during clot formation. And we hope this is going to lead to contact osteogenesis of bone, which bit where the bone is, is laid down directly onto the implant surface. Next thing in our, in our list of features and benefits is the compactors and expanders. Um, as you can see here, I've used various forms of, uh, of, of these sort of instruments over the years, often not specifically designed to the implants that you're placing, uh, which obviously these are specific to the, uh, to the type of implant that, that you're going to be placing. And so that's a big advantage. And they're great for, uh, for, for um, rather than removing bone, they will, com they will compact the bone within the osteotomy um, hopefully giving us better stability of the implants. But as well as using it just simply for compacting and expanding, I like to think of these instruments as a means of assessing the density of the bone. So I always use them as the last step before I place an implant into the osteotomy. And I'm using them as a sort of gauge to assess the, uh, the density of the bone and hence the stability that I can, I can, uh, I can, I can achieve with the implants. So I, maybe you can think of it as like a trial implant, if you like. It's a trial placement just before you put the implant in. So if it goes in very easily, the last one that I'm planning to use, if it goes in easily, then I will uh, opt for the more aggressive threads of the EV implants. Whereas if I'm getting good resistance on the, uh, on the compactor, then I will stick to my standard placement of a 3P. Okay, let's spend a little time now looking at guided surgery. Uh, I'm not going to go into the, to the details of it because uh, I'm sure um, Alan has uh, already made a fantastic presentation in this uh, series of pills uh, seminars. Um, but the first stage, obviously, the first thing to do if you haven't done so already is to go ahead and download the software from, uh, from the BB website. Um, why not? It's completely free and it's very intuitive, very easy to use. Even I can use it. I didn't have any training on it and I just sat down and uh, worked it out within half an hour or so. Um, but yeah, go ahead, download it if you haven't done so already. And if you have any troubles, I'm sure Alan will be, uh, will be, will be on the end of the phone ready to help you. Um, so uh, it's completely free, as I said. The only charge you get is if you want to, to, download, uh, to actually export STL files for printing your own guides, which is certainly not something I want to do. I'm very happy to let the technicians do that for me. Um, and Alan will produce uh, some fabulous surgical guides for you from your plans. Also, the kit. This is the. Uh, these are the instruments that are available uh, on the uh, on the BB kit. Uh, and I've used plenty of guided surgery kits over the years, and this is by far the best. You can see it's been designed and produced by people that are actually doing the job, basically. So again, I won't go through all of the components here, but the workflow is very straightforward. We start up a pair with mucosal punches with a lance drill and with a leveler to just level the crest. And then for all of the cases, we start uh, with our drilling protocol just here with the, uh, the three diameter length eight. And we work our way up this column here, increasing the length. The reason that we do that is, the, is that so that each of these drills is, is, is guided, the, the, uh, the, the shanks on the drill are guided by the sleeve of the guide. And what this does is to, uh, is to basically eliminate the, uh, the sort of deviation, the chatter of the, um, of the tip of the drill. So for example, if we were planning on placing a 14 millimeter by four diameter implant, we start here, we work one, two, three, four, increasing just the length, and then we move across with the, uh, uh, to increase the width. So uh, it's always up here and then across to the diameter that we want. The other great thing though about this kit is that it offers us the ability to use these expander instruments. 
um, so that we can we don't just have to do guided surgery using uh, using drills. We can use the uh, the compactor instruments in a guided fashion. And I I'm not aware of any other kit on the market that allows you to do bone expansion compaction um, through uh, through a surgical guide. Everything is uh, is designed for drilling. So fantastic kit, well thought out. So then, uh, this is uh, one of the cases that uh, that we treated using the B and B guided system. Um, he's really quite an interesting character. This guy. He's uh, he's a former intravenous uh, drug abuser. He's had a, quite a colourful life, should I say? Uh, and he came to me once in the rehabilitation of his upper jaw, but uh, was absolutely terrified of the prospect of, of using any needles um, or uh, or any sort of surgery, which is a bit bizarre, really, given his history. Uh, but we chatted through uh, what we were able to do, and obviously guided surgery was one of the things that came up, and uh, and we decided that this is this is how we we're going to tackle this case. So obviously we've got a, a number of missing teeth here, uh, some uh, some fairly poor crowns, and some uh, discoloured teeth, and he wanted to uh, you know a full uh, full makeover of his uh, of his the aesthetics of his upper jaw. So uh, we uh, we we planned to. Um, uh, to do it all guided, we did uh, a trio scan to start with um, to get the STL files, and we did a CT scan. Uh, and this is the workup that we did uh, in the BB software. We were planning to place five implants, as you can see here, for a three unit bridge on the right hand side, and then single implants here on the left. Um, so uh, so that's, uh, that's how we planned the case. And then uh, Alan Betty produced this lovely guide for us. Um, which we could then took, take to surgery and as usual the thing fits like a glove um, so we were then able to, to place uh, all five of the implants really very efficiently obviously using a little bit of sedation for this guy um, but we got through the surgery fairly quickly fairly uneventfully got the five implants into place as you can see here all uh, in uh, less than 40 minutes or so for him um, so after healing, this, this is uh, how the, the TRIOS scans looked um, and we were then able to, um, to uh, pop the scan bodies in and scan the implants. And this is the restorations as they looked at uh, try-in just a few weeks later and that was the finished result. So really it was all done uh, very, very efficiently for this chap and he now thinks that we are just the best practice ever. Um, so uh, that's how we managed him. One of the problems with guided surgery, which I've heard said many times by, by many speakers, is that it's great in cases where we've got plenty of bone, but it's not so great in cases where the bone is limited. But I think B&B have sort of pushed the envelope a little bit here uh, by allowing us to use these guided compactors, as I said. So where the bone is relatively thin, where we other might, otherwise might need to consider grafting, we can do some bone expansion using, uh, using these uh, guided compactors through the guide and still place implants in a transmucosal fashion. And this was very helpful for me in a case I did recently. Uh, if we look at this lady here, which has a, she has a pretty atrophic maxilla, almost a knife edge ridge there. Um, we were scratching around trying to find uh, to, to position four implants for her because she was desperate to have a fixed prosthesis. Um, we and in particularly in the one area, I think in the I think it was in this left this sort of left lat where we do trying to get an implant somewhere around here. This is what we were faced with was this sort of knife edge ridge of the bone there and when we did the planning for the implant this is a you know the narrowest of the three p's this is the 3.5 diameter implant you can see if we took a, if we did a standard protocol here of drilling we would lose all of this bone up to this level um, and uh, and uh, we would be struggling to get a, a stable implant in place so this case i did using guided compaction we just obviously just use the lance drill to get through here. Uh, and that was the only drill that we used there. Everything else was done with compaction. Uh, this was the case, uh, standard procedure of preparing the temporary model and the guide. And this is it after we placed the implants. Um, and uh, it was all done transmucosally. I did have to make small openings in the tissue here in order to seat the MUAs because of some some uh, some the width of the of the uh, of the crestal bone adjacent to it, and I was actually very curious 
uh, to actually see. When I made this small incision to seat the MUA, I was able to have a sneak peek at the um, at the labial plated bone around this implant and was very pleased to see it was totally intact. So there we go. This allowed us to treat this lady who is, as you can see, is quite an elderly lady um, who was not a candidate for bone grafting uh, and still to provide her with an all on four type solution. And she was very happy. OK, um, let's just say a few words about pterygoid implants, which I'm not terribly uh, experienced with, but I have started doing several cases now um, since uh, since coming out to Bologna. Um, and this is an alternative solution for the posterior maxilla to, to really avoid sinus lifting. So if we look at the implants here, it's quite a strange looking beast, isn't it? Um, first of all, it's, it's quite wide in diameter because there are in, in this area of the, of the jaw, it's going to get a hell of a lot of force on it. So it's a 4.7 millimeter diameter implant and they come in just two lengths, either 16 or 18 because obviously it's got to, got to go a long way through the tuberosity up into the, to the pterygo process. Um, what you also see about this implant is it's got three completely different uh, uh, zones on it. This first zone here in the apical part looks like a standard 3P implant with a standard thread because this is going to be engaging into really quite hard uh, type 1, possibly 2 bone in the uh, in the in the um, uh, in the, uh, the the pterygoid process of the of the sphenoid bone. This next section here has the more aggressive threads that you'd see on the EV implant because this is the area that's going to be passing through the tuberosity of the maxilla. And then finally in the crestal area up here, we have this nice polished surface. Why is that? Because that's basically because some of this may well be in contact not with bone tissue, but with soft tissue. So that's why it has this relatively strange looking design. So where do the pterygoids go, basically? Um, this is a case that, uh, that I treated recently. Uh, obviously, you can see a totally pneumatized sinus here, and this lady that's completely edentulous in the posterior areas, and this premolar tooth had to be extracted. So the first thing that we, that we looked at and thought about was the possibility of, um, of doing, uh, doing traditional, pro tr 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 traditional treatment using a lateral window sinus lift, uh, which is obviously uh, fairly... Uh, invasive for an elderly lady um, and um, it obviously leads to a fair bit of mobility and remember in her case she'd have to go through this twice once on each side um, it takes at least six months for it to heal before we can place any implants and then at least another four months probably after implants uh, are placed before we can start the prosthetics so really it's going to be a year round with two with three surgeries before this lady gets any teeth so we looked at the alternative um, of uh, providing these uh, pterygoid implants. Uh, if we just look at the anatomy here, so here we've got the tuberosity, and we've got the, the lateral and medial pterygoid plates here. Um, looking at it from the back here, you can see the same sort of anatomy here. So these implants are gonna start in this sort of position, and they're gonna be angled superiorly and slightly medially in order to, to, to come out through, just, just perforating the, the really hard bone that we have in, the, in between the two pterygoid plates. So they're going through three bones, the tuberosity of the maxilla, then the pyramidal process of the palatine bone, and then the taint of the pterygoid process of the sphenoid bone. Well, we have really hard bone and we can really fix these implants well into this hard bone tissue. So if we look at how we executed this case, uh, uh, first of all, how we planned it, um, we, we, we planned the placement of two pterygoid implants. Uh, we also uh, did an immediate implant uh, uh, following the loss of the, uh, of the premolar tooth just here. And if we, look at the, uh, if we look at it distally, you can see the angulation that we've achieved on these implants and they're just protruding through there into the hard bone that we have in the, uh, in the pterygopalatine. Uh, in the in the uh, in the pterygoid bone. Uh, let's look at it at surgery. This is basically after we completed the surgery. It was all done by a guided approach, all transmucosally. So we placed three implants: the two pterygoids here and here, and this was the immediate implant into the into the fore socket. We already have an implant here. You see, this has been there ten years. It's an ankylos implant, so we're going to use that to restore it. And this was the view immediately after surgery, after the placement of these two pterygoids and this single implant just there. And then finally, let's finish off just by mentioning a few of the other offerings that, uh, that we have from B&B, &B, um, which are the slim, wide, and yuxtagrid implants. 
So slim implants, uh, I don't use them very often, but there are cases where you're going to need to use them. They're available in two diameters. Here we have the three, which as you can see is similar in design to the to the 3P implants. And then we have the, the 3.4 diameter implant, which is similar in design to the, to the EV implant. Um, and the connection at the top is the same. Now, we do have to mention, I know we talked a lot about the Connexa connection earlier. These slim implants are the only ones that have a different connection. So uh, you do have to carry a small number of components uh, for, for the prosthetics for these. Um, uh, so um, these, I simply use these where there is limited space, where we simply cannot place the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the standard implant in between the two teeth. So they're particularly useful for, for lower incisors and for upper lateral incisors. And that's about the only time I ever use them. Then we also have these wide implants, which are not something I particularly use. Uh, they're available in 5.5, 6, 6.5 and 7 millimeter diameter. They have the standard connexa connection, yes. And they're really suitable for immediate placements in the molar regions. And again, that's not something that I'm particularly keen on in, in my practice. So again, I don't really use these. And then the final offering that we would just like to mention at the end are these subperiosteal or yuxta grid implants. Uh, which is something I'm quite excited about. I have no experience with them, uh, but I'm hoping to get that experience uh, later in the year with a trip out to Italy, uh, COVID permitting, obviously. Um, they are fully designed and constructed digitally um, and, are suited, and are an alternative solution to major bone grafting procedures where conventional implantation is, is, is impossible. So I think this is, this is something that's really quite exciting uh, for, our, for our elderly patients who are severely compromised. And we, if we can offer them a solution uh, that's a, a one-stage surgery without major bone grafting, I think that is something that, uh, that we really should be looking at. Okay, so that's gone through the, the features and benefits, and I hope that you can see why I decided to make the leap. And if we're summing all this up, I think I'd like to say that B&B &B provides us with some very well-designed products, very well-engineered products, and the solutions are well-proven. It's very obvious when you work with this company that these products are designed by people that are actually doing the job, which is, is fantastic because so many of these, com these, uh, these companies, the things are designed by, by scientists and, and then approved by people in boardrooms um, with, uh, that, uh, that don't actually get anywhere near a patient's mouth. So uh, I think that's invaluable. They provide you with all the instruments you need, which again is fantastic. And they also provide us with a fully integrated digital workflow, which is really important to me. And also, Important, obviously, they provide very cost-effective solutions. When you compare the cost of these to the big implant names, then uh, then that's uh, important for us and also for our patients, obviously, as well. And then finally, and quite importantly, I think it's uh, the ethos is, of this company is that it is a family company. And the people out there are people that I like and that I respect and that I enjoy working with. And that, for me, is very important. And I hope if you're considering uh, switching to EV implants, you'll, you'll take these points on board and, and consider making the switch as I did. So that's really all I have to say today. So uh, I'm going to say thank you for your attention and thank you to everyone at B&B for asking me to prepare this webinar. Thank you. Bye-bye. on the link below and contact us for more information. Click 